Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 499. That's right. We're almost there. Today, we're going to have an impromptu look back over the last five years of content, and I'm going to share with you some of my favorite moments, as well as give you a little bit of a, what's going on behind the scenes. Should be fun. On the off chance that you don't know my name, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a passionate traditional martial artist. Everything we do here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we're doing from this show and onward, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's our, our hub. It's our fortress. It's the place you can buy our products. From our strength and conditioning program to, if you're listening to this into the future, some of the other programs that we've got in development right now to our protective equipment, our uniforms, our great shirts, sweatshirts. There's a lot of stuff over there. And if you buy any of it, you can save 15% by using the code PODCAST15. This show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's where we put up transcripts and post photos, videos, links to the guests. We are constantly revising that website, trying to make it better. As of the writing, well, I guess the recording of this episode, you can look up episodes by location as in where is the guest coming from, what country, what state in the U.S., what style do they practice, and soon you'll get a complete table with release date and links to their social media, so if you want to quickly find and follow someone, you'll have that available. We're hoping to have that rolled out in the next couple of weeks. All that and so much more comes in this neat little package that we release here on the show twice a week, and if you want to support it, if you want to support the goal that we have of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists the world over, there are a number of things you can do. You can share an episode. You can make a purchase. You can follow us on social media. Maybe pick up a book. Tell a friend about us. Leave a review somewhere or support the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. That's the place to go. You can support with as little as $2 a month. But if you contribute $5 a month, you're going to get extra stuff, extra episodes, things that we don't release to the public. This episode today is completely off the cuff, and I contemplated whether or not I wanted to take some notes, have an outline, which I typically do. I usually have something in front of me to refer to, but I didn't want to do that today. Uh, why? Why didn't I want to do that? Because I wanted to be as authentic as possible. You know, one of the things that's really easy to do with a podcast is to edit to cut pieces out, and I'm going to work really, really hard as I record this to make sure there's nothing that has to be edited. And this is a good point for me to shout out Julius, who has been our audio engineer for three years. He does an absolutely phenomenal job making this show look and sound as good as it can be. And I want everyone to know, because I, I've thanked him publicly, but I want everyone to know right now that this show would not be what it is without Julius. So thank you. I appreciate you, my friend. There are other people to thank. Over the last year, you may have noticed that I've talked about someone else, Lessie. And Lessie has been a huge improvement in connecting and scheduling guests versus what I was doing. I found that I was just burnt out. There are only so many things that we can care about in a given day. And I was finding that my caring, that's not the right word, my attentiveness, there we go, that's a better word, to working with guests and making sure that they were onboarded properly and scheduled well, I was getting burnt out on that. And that was affecting the show in that it was affecting my conversations. And so now because of Lessie, she puts in some time every week, she gets great guests. And if you look back over the last year of this show, you will see that overall the caliber of guests that we've been getting has been bigger and better. Not to say that we're only going after celebrities or anything like that, but we have had a, in my opinion, a more diverse range of martial artists from a broader global perspective. And I think that that has really stepped up the show. And I hope you all appreciate it because I certainly do. And with her work, it also means that quite often when I talk to the guests, that's the first communication I've ever had with them is on radio, if you will, the same time you get to hear them. And I love that. And I think that that leads to a better quality episode. 
I'm going to drink some tea right now. See, this is one of the things that we're not going to edit out. We're not going to take out me slurping tea because I want this to be the realest episode that I've done. And yeah, so Lessy, you rock. Thank you. I appreciate your friendship, your counsel, and all of your work. There are other people that do things behind the scenes. Uh, we've got Anne, we've got Andrea, we've got others coming on right now who all contribute in their various ways. We've got Andrew and Stacy helping out in the Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes Facebook group. We've got Gabe doing what he does. We've got Frank doing what he does with First Cup, which is not martial arts radio, but it's still part of the team. There are so many people who help out. Some of these people honestly donate their time. Why do they donate their time? Because they believe in what we're doing. It is no secret, because I don't make it one, that Whistle Kick is not yet profitable. We've been at this for a long time. I will continue to work hard to make this business profitable, and I will throw everything I possibly have at it. I have invested literally every dollar I have and many more that I don't because I believe in what we're doing. And I knew that this would be a long time coming. We figured out a lot of things. We're figuring out more. And that's part of what this episode is. As rambly as it is that it's going to be, it's a recap. It's letting you know what's going on behind the scenes and not pulling punches because that's not my style. Some of you may be aware We did an episode talking about it, the strength and conditioning program. That came as a result of a few things. One, my love of both martial arts and physical fitness and finding ways to tie the two together. But it was also the recognition that, hey, you know what? We have not had the best track record with maintaining inventory of our physical products. That whole side of the business is so much harder than I ever imagined. You would think, oh, You save some money or borrow some money and you order some stuff and it shows up and you sell it and you take the profit and you do it again and repeat, repeat, repeat. And that's how it should work. But it's not how it works because you have things like the coronavirus that steps up and your major sales platform, which in our case happens to be Amazon. Yes, we sell far more on Amazon than we do on our own website because that's where people go. There was a point in time where Amazon said, you can't send us more stuff. And people stopped buying stuff because Amazon was taking forever to ship anything that wasn't masks or hand sanitizer. And I'm not saying that they made the wrong decision. I'm saying that it impacted our business. And that coupled with things like, you know, our incredibly picky quality control and some troublesome shipments and shipments getting delayed and all of these things have really made it hard for us to build the financial future on the product side of the business. We're small potatoes. We really are. We're a small company. And I can only imagine what it's like trying to manage this stuff as one of our larger competitors. I do not envy that side of the business. So what you're going to see moving forward, and uh, the current plan is that episode 501 will be a look into the future, whereas 499 is a look backwards. But I expect that When we talk in 501, we're going to talk more about these digital programs and how we can put some things out that don't require us to, um, I don't want to put this, that we don't have to hope everybody else does their job right in order for us to make a sale. So over the last five years of this show, we have tried and failed, or at least not succeeded at a number of things. You know, I I take a look at the audio quality where it is now. You know, Julius has been a huge part of that, but so has been this much more expensive microphone. Many of you don't know, when we launched this show, I was using a $25 Logitech headset. And that's what we used for, shoot, I have no idea how long it was. It was a long time. Over a year, I think. Because I wasn't confident in my ability to stay focused enough and stay close to this microphone. I mean, there, there's a skill in doing this. And I want you to watch something. And hopefully Julius doesn't fix this part. But I'm talking to you now. And then I turn away and I look over just to the side, just, you know, not even 90 degrees to the left. And the audio changes that dramatically. And if I look over to the right, because there's something going on out the window, it happens again. Right. And I'm, 
I get distracted. It happens. And by having a headset with that mic right in front of my face, I couldn't help but speak into it. But now with this big fancy microphone on this big articulating arm, I think we put $500 into this thing total. We get much better sound quality. And I'm glad that we do. You can hear it with the guests. You know, their audio isn't usually as good because they don't usually spend as much money on their microphone. And that's okay. You know, here's another, I'm going to have another sip of tea because it's talking constantly. I, I, I need to do this. See, this is stuff you would usually get uh, audio <laughs> edited out. One of the things that changed early on, not early on, one of the things that we did early on was we used Skype for our recording. I would, you know, get a guest to sign up and send me their Skype handle and we would have a Skype chat and Skype out of the box didn't support recording the conversation. So we had a, a third party piece of software that would save the audio. And that combination, those two programs together, failed on me so many times. And the final straw, those of you that know me know that vacation is not a word that I take lightly. I took a week off with some friends in January of 20, I think, 18. And we threw our motorcycles in a trailer and we drove to Florida, you know, 24 hours each way. And we rode around for the week and it was great. But I think it was day three or four, I got an email from Julia saying, hey, Jeremy, the next four episodes are silence. The recording software we used actually recorded silence. And my check until that point had always been, is it recording? Yep, it's recording. But there's no way to stop and check if the audio is working with the way that we were using. And it never occurred to me that it wouldn't work. Well, I got back. Everybody rescheduled. and. Trust me, this was not the first time we lost episodes. There are, there, there's one other person I'm thinking of, uh, Guru Peter Friedman. I really hope to have him back on the show. We conducted a great interview and it was, it was gone. It just wasn't there. And I said, you know, it's time to switch. And I looked at what everyone else was doing. I had a few friends with podcasts and they were all using Zoom. So two years ago, before most of the world even knew what Zoom was, we were using Zoom to record because it did everything it needed to do all in one package and for free. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're contemplating audio quality of the paid versus the free version. There are some circumstances where just because of the way they're doing the recording, it might be beneficial for us to stay with the paid version. The only time we've paid for this software in the past is if we need more than two people because there's a limit on the free version of 40 minutes if you have if you have more than if you have more than two people going. And we don't do very many episodes with that, but the audio quality difference, we're considering it. What else didn't go well? Some of you may remember Martial Arts Calendar. We put a year into that. We put a year into trying to collate, to collect all of the different events that were happening. We were going to start with the US and then roll it out globally. And I actually paid someone. I think we put in at least $1,500 on this project, maybe $2,500 across the year to try and get a single spot where you could go and find out, hey, are there any seminars in my area this weekend? Where's the nearest tournament this weekend? And we populated all that data. We went to every single circuit that was there. And as we did it, we were emailing people, we're letting everyone know. And in that year, we had, I think, four people submit events. That was it. And, you know, I was, I was really down on that idea. It, it hurt because it made so much sense to me. And whether the world wasn't ready, maybe still isn't ready, maybe we did a bad job of promoting it. There are a lot of ways that you could look at it and say, well, here's how it could have gone better. But the point was we pulled the plug on that and took those resources, that time and future revenue and put it into other things. We have tried a lot of things. Uh, if any of you, our, our biggest uh, product failure, physical product failure was our belts. If anybody remembers the belts, you may, you may have purchased one. And if you purchased one, you got one of the ones that was good. Unfortunately, the factory that we asked, that we, we vetted, uh, the factories that we were working with for other things did not do belts. And these folks sent us samples and they were phenomenal. Everything was great. The order we placed took 
longer than it was supposed to to arrive. We were short uh, 15 or 20% in what we ordered. The lengths were inconsistent. The thickness was inconsistent. The width was inconsistent. Some of them embroidered our logo upside down. Uh, Some of them, this was the one that blew me away. I said, how can they even imagine this is okay? Some of them, in order to get the correct length, sewed two smaller pieces together. You could see it in the middle. (laughs) And uh, so we took those belts and we threw them up on Amazon as a one-time thing. And we were selling them. I think we tried selling them at $20 and that didn't work. And in the end, because just the way things in Amazon work, it was cheaper for us to throw away 50 of them. It would have cost more for us to have them sent back to us. And then what were we going to do with them? So we disposed of a number of belts. If, if any of you out there have one of those first and I guess only generation whistle kick belts, hold on to it. That, if, we, if we go somewhere, wh- let me say that better. When we go somewhere, that'll be worth something. So save your first gen whistle kick belt even if it's not perfect. Now I'm intentionally slurping the tea so you know that I'm still here. I haven't gone away. What else did we screw up? Um, We've got some episodes where, I'll be honest, I thought the guest was terrible because we don't have any conversation ahead of time with guests. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to spend more time talking to them before we talk to them. Because then they share all the good stories. I tried doing this early on with with some people. And they would share all their good stories. And then when they told me the story the second time, they weren't as into it because they knew they'd already told me, even though you listeners hadn't heard it before. So, you know, we've had a few duds, but not very many. Out of 500 episodes, I don't think we've had even five. So I'm going to call it a 99% success rate. And I think that's pretty darn good. What else have we been successful with? You as a community have kept me accountable. We have had amazing conversation over email. We've had great conversation in the Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes Facebook group. And you have all stepped up to send in guest suggestions and tell me what you think and where you're at in the world and your training. And I love getting those emails. I get a few a week, every week and have for for years. And it continues to be the greatest thing that I take away from this is the connection with so many of you. I have people in this world now who I consider friends. I've never met them. I hope to. Hope to train with them. You know, somebody like Jared Wilson, Sensei Jared Wilson, has become a good friend. We message and tease each other and support each other with our podcasts. And we had the chance to train together once. But then you've got someone else like Sensei Ando, who I consider a friend, someone who I would really go to bat for because I believe in what he's doing. He does a great job with Fight for a Happy Life. And if you're not following both of those gentlemen, you should be because they they produce wonderful content. I've never met Ando. I want to. I want to train with him. I want to hang out with him, grab a beer, whatever it is, because I think he's a really good guy. And the numbers of people that I have, quote unquote, met in that way, man, it's mind-boggling. Now, the one thing we don't do with this show is release numbers. We don't talk about, you know, this episode's done better than this episode. But there are a couple things that I can tell you. We have been downloaded in just about every country on Earth. Last time I looked, it was something like 175 countries out of, I think there are 254 recognized countries. Quite a few of them are islands you know, Pacific Island nations where there aren't very many people and internet is sporadic. So it doesn't surprise me that there aren't so many martial artists clamoring to get content that we haven't been downloaded. But if you can think of the name of a country, we've been downloaded there. Of course, it's the English speaking countries where we have the most traction because this show is in English. And Having the transcripts, for those of you that don't know, we do a transcript eventually on every single episode. We, we had the, the first 100, 150, we didn't have that going. So we've been slowly going back, adding them back in because that takes time. If you imagine listening to this whole thing and then writing down every word, that's a lot of work. 
And then sometimes we get guests with thick accents and that makes it hard for the people doing the transcription. But we're doing everything we can. And then once that transcription happens, then we get people who are able to use Google Translate or whatever to read it, if not listen to it, from other languages, you know. And and that's been great. That's been a lot of fun. And I, I love seeing the download numbers. Last I knew, and I'm going to give you kind of a round number here. If you add up visits to our website and downloads of the episode and YouTube hits and everything else related to this show, it is well over half a million. It's something like 600 something thousand downloads, which now we're not Joe Rogan. He does that in, in one episode. But in our world, in what we do, that's been pretty big. And we've been recognized for that. And I, I don't want to talk more about that because I, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've been working on over the last five years is embracing this odd sort of status that I have. I've had people come up to me and say, your voice is familiar. Are you the guy with the podcast? Which blew me away. This was years ago. And I've had people get genuinely excited. I, I met, some, met a woman who jumped up and down when she met me. That's odd to me. Because <laughs> to me, I'm just me. To some of you out there, I represent something more. And I don't know that I'm ever going to be comfortable with that. But I accept it. I will continue to do everything I can to further the traditional martial arts because they have given so much to me. They have given me a career. They have given me purpose. They have given me friends. They have given me physical skills and emotional, you know, coping skills. I have hinted at it at times, but I will say it point blank right now. I do not believe I would have survived my teenage years without martial arts. I don't think I would have made it. To say it in an even more pointed way, I likely would have taken my life. I don't know that I will ever fully tell the story around that because it's hypothetical. I'm still here. So I don't want to dwell on that. But when you look at what we're doing and wonder, why is Jeremy so passionate? Why is he willing to risk bankruptcy and give up his social life and do so many other things for this company? It's because I feel obligated. I feel like this is my opportunity to leave a, a mark on the world. It's through this show and through Whistlekick as a, a broader concept. And the, I guess, this ability to reach people and share some ideas. Now, some of those ideas aren't always met with complete open minds. I feel very strongly that one should not define what a martial art is and is not, because none of us have the authority to determine that. Somebody out there will always say that this or this is or is not a martial art. I can imagine that every single style that we train in today, back when it was founded, the founder likely had someone telling them, you can't do that. That's not right. That's who says that you get to determine this is a new style? And the definition of what is and is not a style leads to the conversation around McDojo's. And my comment, my uh, recommendation there is the same as it's always been. Focus on you and your training. Stop worrying about what everyone else is doing. Does it harm the martial arts to have bad martial arts out there? Yes. But you know the best way to make what bad martial artists are doing go away? Create such a gap between them and all the rest of us that no one can look at it and think that it's martial arts. Excuse me. Focus on you. Focus on getting better. That has always been my suggestion because it's what you can control. I can't control how any of you hear what I'm saying today. I can't control whether you like me or agree with me. And frankly, I've gotten a lot better at not caring. Because if you don't like me and you don't like what I have to say, you can just turn off the show. Have we received hate? Yep. Have we had people that get so bent out of shape about something I say 
that they feel the need to write a long rambling email or comment on a show notes page. Yep. Guess what? If they took the time to do that, it means I struck a chord with them. It means I made them think. And if you know me and how I look at this show, my goal is to make you think. I don't care that you agree. I care that you think. If I say something and it sparks some inner dialogue for you, and in the end, you are diametrically, completely, absolutely opposed to what I'm saying, that's fine. Because I made you think. I don't like when people parrot things back. I don't like when your opinions are forged in the words of someone else. We all need to be able to think for ourselves. We need to be able to train for ourselves. Ooh, there was a tangent that I was not expecting to have with this show. Maybe I should have videoed this one. Where are we at? Closing up on 30 minutes. I'm going to keep going. Who knows how long this is going to take. If you go back, all the way back, episode two, we had a guest on, Mr. Glenn Stafford, a friend of mine, someone I think the world of. Love him dearly. Glenn was supposed to be the host of this show. Most of you don't know that. I think we've talked about that once. We probably talked about that on his episode. Glenn was intended to be the host of the show. We met, we talked about it, we worked on format, we talked about tech, we, we had it all worked out because I was going to work on other things. If you take a look at the way I run this company, I try to get other people to do other stuff so I can go on to building another thing and then handing that off to somebody else. That method's worked pretty well. But as we were getting ready, we weren't far off from planning out our first few episodes. Glenn had a stroke at 45 years old, nearly died, was, according to the story I have heard, probably within 30 minutes of dying had he not reached the hospital in time. The only reason he did is because Glenn's fiance, a wonderful woman named Debbie, is a nurse. Glenn started feeling some symptoms, called Debbie. She said, you get your butt to the hospital right now. As soon as he was good to move, they moved him to Tennessee, where he lives now. He's mostly back. He's pretty darn close to 100%, 98 99%. He's recovered well. But that meant that we had this idea for this show and no one to run it. Who was left? Me. So I reluctantly took the helm here. Now, if you had known me five years ago, you would know that I'm not really a big fan of being front and center. I like getting work done. I like making an impact. I've never been a big fan of being the person out front, the person with the microphone. If we were in a band, I never would have been the lead singer or the lead anything. But in growing this show, it became very clear that I had to learn how to work past that how to put that aside. And I think I've done a pretty good job of that. I am not the same person now that I was five years ago. Jeremy now at coming up on 41 is very different from Jeremy at 36. And I assume next year and the year after that, I'll continue to grow and get better because, you know, just like martial arts training, I'm trying to, trying to grow trying to be a better person as we make this show better and everything else that we do. So while I am sad that Glenn had to go through that, and I wish it had never happened, the outcome, I think for both of us, ended up okay. I know he's happy with his life. Would it have gone exactly the same? I don't know. Who knows when he would have moved? I know that he and you know, I, I was fortunate enough to attend their wedding. They're a wonderful couple. I love them both dearly. But I wouldn't have had this opportunity for growth. And those of you who know me personally, you've likely seen a change. Nobody's told me as I, as I say that. Nobody's told me. But I don't know how often people tell you that you've grown. Certainly at five foot seven on a good day. Nobody told me growing up I was growing. <laughs> I stopped growing up pretty early. I think back to the guests that we've had, the people that we've talked to. We've lost two. Auntie Jim Smith, who I was fortunate enough to meet a couple times uh, when we had the Whistlekick Tournament in 2016. I invited him. I said, 
please come and compete as my guest. That was a great competition. We had six, eight, 10th degree black belts competing that day. And Hanchi's episode was early on. It was in the first 30, maybe even the first 25. And when he passed away, I reposted it somewhere and had a few people write to me and say, thank you. You know, this, the stories of this man that these people held dear to themselves, that was a bad way to say it. This story that these people, let's try it one more time because his memory deserves this. The stories of this man that these people held dear, they're now preserved forever. And that was one of the goals. You know, one of the other people that we've lost that I was fortunate enough to talk to was Grandmaster Jun Ri. I mean, it's just about as iconic a martial arts name as you get. And his episode, if you listen to it, it was odd. It wasn't a lot about martial arts, but it was about him and what was important to him at that time, which, you know, as a man who was, let's face it, sick, and we could probably say now in hindsight, dying, and knew he was dying, he said the things that were important to him. So we have these stories from these two gentlemen and from all of these other wonderful, amazing people, and these stories are available forever. When we launched the show, people w- would tell me, oh, well, you know, why don't you have the, the first, you know, make, make the, um, you know, the last 10 episodes free, and if they want older ones, they've got to pay. No, I, that was important to me not to do. I don't want any interviews that we ever do to be restricted by money. I want the stories that these people tell to be made available all over the place. Some of you know that we've started taking some of the interviews and turning them into books because there are some people who don't listen to podcasts and, you know, they could read the transcript for free, but maybe they want it on their Kindle. And excuse me, we sell it for 99 cents. And some of those people, maybe they want to hold it in a paperback book and we sell those for three ninety nine, because when you add everything up, we, we barely make any money on those. 99 cents is the lowest we can charge for a Kindle book. And I think the, the three ninety nine is, I think we're making like 20 cents. If you know how retail works, selling things at 0.99 tends to work out better. If you've made it this far into the episode, you probably really like this show because I can't imagine anybody listening to these ramblings <laughs> unless they have, uh, they find a lot of value in the show and my words. And to those of you still listening, I want to say thank you. I appreciate you. If you've written to me, you likely know that something I'm, I'm fond of saying is without people listening to the show, I would just be a crazy person talking to, into a microphone. Because without an audience, the work that we do, the things that I do with this microphone, they're kind of a waste of time. But because of you, this matters. Because of you, I have a responsibility. And I take that responsibility very seriously. I try really hard not to step on what the guests say. I try hard on Thursday episodes to express my opinions in ways that I've really spent time thinking about. I never want anyone to blindly accept anything I say or do. And I hope you don't. I hope I continue to receive respectful (laughs) emails because they, they overwhelmingly are emails, social media, et cetera, challenges to the things that I think and and say, because that's how I get better. And we can correlate that out with sparring. We try all these techniques, but it's when we work together with them, we find out where do these fit? Are they useful? Oh, it's useful in this situation, but maybe not this. And this is how I develop my definition of martial arts. It's how I've arrived at so many of these quotes that you might see flying around on social media, on our social media. If you purchase the Martial Artist Handbook, you see some of those quotes in the text and in the chapter headings. And I'm honored and humbled that people care about what I say. And it's never been about me. I think this is where we'll end it. If, and and if you know me, 
you might believe what I'm about to say. If you don't know me, you may not believe it. And that's okay, because it doesn't change the truth. I have goals. I have goals for Whistlekick because I have goals for martial arts. Our business model here at Whistlekick is very simple. If it gets people into or keeps them in traditional martial arts, we'll do it. Because I believe that everyone is better with at least a little bit of martial arts training. Where would the world be if everyone trained in some form of traditional martial arts for six months? It is the only thing that leaves those lasting lessons. I don't know too many people who reflect fondly on six months of soccer as a child and say, you know, that really, I'm glad I did that. I want my kids to do six months of soccer. But I've heard many, many people say, you know, I did karate or taekwondo or whatever for six months when I was a kid, and it really helped me a lot. I want to make sure my kids do that too. I want everybody to train. I want everybody to have the opportunity to train, and I want martial arts to continue to move forward. And if there was a magic wand I could wave that I'd fade away in figurative or literal way, and those goals would accomplish, I would do it in a heartbeat because I love martial arts and what it has done for me and so many others that much. This is the point when we wind down the episodes and I usually go into my fancy closing. See, I've got my sheet here to make sure that I remember everything. But I'm not going to do that today. There are times when we record an episode where the importance of that episode and the words that I'm saying, it feels hollow to follow them with something like that. So I'm not going to do that. I am going to ask you for a few things, though. I'm going to ask you to continue to have an open mind, to continue to train, and to continue to look for ways to become a better person, inside and outside of martial arts, because and maybe even despite martial arts. Martial arts as a pursuit is only as good as we are as individuals. The more jerks we have participating, it brings martial arts down. So if you love martial arts the way I do, the best things you can do are be as good of a person as you can and spread that good through martial arts. We're all the caretakers of this thing that we love. So let's treat it with the respect it deserves. And that's where I'm going to end. Until next time, train hard smile, and have a great day.